Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this um, jam-packed session. Uh, in this session, we're going to be talking about ROI, so that's Return on Investment of Disability Inclusion. I've got a fantastic um, panel with me today, and um, they've all got different insights that they'll be bringing to this topic. It's quite a big topic, and uh, lots of people have many different opinions on this topic and so we'll really value um, obviously for people that are listening to, to listen in but also if you have an opportunity to to ask questions um, to our uh, panel today. Okay so um, without further ado um, my name is Ari Latif I should mention and uh, I'm going to be um, facilitating uh, this session. I'm going to try my best to facilitate this session of some amazing panelists so um, to kick off, um, we'll go around the panel and um, I'll start by asking a question uh, to the panel. So if you can just introduce yourself and just share your thoughts on the question, um, which is really um, one of the most fundamental questions in this area. So how do we persuade key stakeholders of the value um, when it comes to uh, uh, disability and inclusion. And um, if we start off with Kush, are you okay to just give a little introduction about yourself and uh, and kick off with this question? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Adi. Um, so my name's Kush Kanodia. Um, I'm a social entrepreneur and a disability rights um, campaigner. Um, so in regards to the question, the value of accessibility and inclusion, um, I found that the media has actually been very helpful in re in regards to raising the the value. So I um, implemented a campaign that abolished all disabled car parking charges um, from 206 NHS trust hospitals. It was implemented into law last year at the end of April. It helped 2.5 million disabled people to access critical healthcare in England by abolishing all disabled car parking charges from all NHS hospitals in England, basically getting the UK government to invest over a billion pounds in this initiative. And I was a governor at Chelsea Westminster Hospital. They wanted to start charging for disabled parking. So I raised the campaign. We were kind of published in the Times, the Daily Mail, the Telegraph, and that helped to kind of influence change. Um, so, sorry, there's a little bit of background noise. Um, there you go, Kush, I've muted Bernard. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so, so like in the UK, we know that say three out of five of all COVID-19 deaths are disabled people, even though we amount to 17% of the population. And this was actually the most significant disability inclusion policy change that happened in England during the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. Um, in the summer, I guess it was acknowledged by Kent University that gave me an honorary doctorate. And they actually said it was the most significant and impactful change in the inclusion um, in the treatment of disabled people since the founding of the NHS. Um, and if we're thinking about return on investment, um, so the UK government invested over a Sorry, Kish. Um, a bit more back. Sorted. Sorry. The UK government invested over a billion pounds in this policy initiative. And when we're thinking about return on investment, so if I can help a disabled person to go to an NHS hospital without them getting COVID, what is the return on investment? If I can get a disabled person to get treated in a cost of living crisis when people are looking at between heating and eating and maybe they get their cancer treated that you know before it becomes untreatable, what's the return on investment? As a, as a disabled person, if I can access healthcare then I can access education and employment. Like all these other industries become accessible to me. So to me, actually, it's probably the most significant return on investment um, that the UK government has done, I believe, in the pandemic and cost of living crisis. But how you equate that becomes difficult because it depends on the time period that you're analysing. Thanks. 
Thank you, Kirsten. That's great. So um, bring, bring, bring on the media, um, help to share the story and the importance, I guess, of disability inclusion. Um, can we move on to uh, another one of our panelists? Uh, Kathy, hi there. Could you, could you briefly just uh, introduce yourself, Kathy, and, uh, and also um, your take uh, on, on this question on how to get key stakeholders um, uh, involved and show them the value of disability inclusion? Yep, thanks, Eddie. Uh, so I'm Cathy Holloway. I'm what's called the academic director. I'm also a co-founder of the Global Disability Innovation Hub, which is a startup uh, in the disability space in its own right. And, and we've grown since uh, 2016 to now to being operational in 34 countries with a research and practice portfolio of about 50 million pounds in, in disability innovation. Uh, and how we've done that is, is partly through a lot of hard work, <laughs> uh, but partly through working in partnerships, uh, qu quite global partnerships, but also local partnerships within global spaces. So we, we work with Kush, we also work with Bernard. Um, and uh, I was going to just pull out sort of two, maybe two, two, maybe things. One is the 80 20 30 program that we run for UK aid. So you know, UK aid at one level is, is aid money, uh, UK taxpayer money to try and, and, and help. Uh, global development towards uh, sustainable development goals and global development more generally. But what we've managed to do is create an innovation ecosystem which set up the first um, assistive technology accelerator in Kenya, which Bernard, of course, will speak about, but also test the model of an assistive technology impact fund. And between those two things, we've um, evidenced the quality of life improvements of ventures. So it's really easy in the in the disability space to know what the cost is. Kush can, you know, everywhere you go, they tell you the cost. It's, there's a cost, a cost, a cost to disability, but there's a massive social benefit, but also economic benefit. And it's not just to the individual. That's also a thing Like you can state, for example, at scale, the Global Partnership on Assistive Technology produced a nice shiny document that shows you it's a nine to one investment, return on investment. Uh, if you if you uh, back disabled people with assistive technology in low and middle income countries, brilliant. So near your venture capitalist, I believe that's a really good investment figure. But when you actually go to then invest in that space, it's really bloody hard. If I'm honest, excuse me, but it's really hard because the infrastructure is not there to absorb the money. So what we're also trying to do is give that infrastructure to people and, and help governments build that infrastructure. So a different example is the IFC work we've been doing with World Bank uh, IFC, saying, okay, how do you make sure the the big infrastructure investments and i don't mean just like you're know, building a city i mean if you're going to do say uh, mobile finance you're gonna you're going to help uh, a fintech uh, thing happen in a country uh, there are already frameworks like the two by frameworks for gender investment what's the equivalent for disability investment how do we ensure these these large programs get funded and are beneficial to disabled people, but also we're capturing the benefits. So I could I could talk on this for a while, Adi, but I, I'd love to <laughs> hand it back and hear from others. No, thank you so much, and, that, and that's great. So um, it's good to see that there is research to support the value in 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 this area. So that's that's fantastic. Um, who next? Can uh, Nir? Can you can you give us a, a little bit of a, a background to, to yourself yeah. and, mm -hmm. and your thoughts on this area? Yeah, thank you. So, so first of all, um, hi, and I'm really happy to be here. My name is Neil Cohen, and um, I'm an innovator, actually. I work, and I will explore more about that and share more about my experience, but basically what I do is I have three hats, mainly, regarding to your question. One of them is the, being the CEO and founder of Building. So for the last 15 years, I'm mainly focused on innovation and sustainability, and sustainability as part of it is, of course, accessibility and inclusion been working through training or courses or ESG report or SDG uh, uh, parameter, as Kathy mentioned, and, and working on, on all sides of it, sometimes working with corporates and with startups, with government offices and with cities, and mainly creating the ecosystem focus on these two aspects. So one thing and the other thing is I do is, is uh, I'm access Israel innovator and I'm working with them on a project called the possible that I would be happy to share about about how you create more accessibility by design processes and another thing it is I'm the chairman of the board of the Rexos of Hacotism, which is an NGO that focuses on the connections between innovation and autism. And two things regarding to your uh, what you've mentioned about how do you connect them and try to focus on the corporate aspect and how do you connect real corporates to see the value of uh, of inclusion and to see the real meaning of it so 
one thing about it is is someone is coming to the room. So one thing about it is about seeing the connection between these two giant things that the organization is doing, sometimes doing good, but they don't see the connection between these two. And one of them is innovation, and the other one is sustainability or accessibility. So sometimes they have accessibility employment and they have diversity within the organization, and that's great. And other organizations, of course, do some things related to innovation, but not all of them see the connection. And if they want, want to see the impact you gotta do or see the connection between these two and I, I believe that the real ROI of inclusion of accessibility is to doing the connection to develop your innovative product with people with disability not because you want to offer them something new tomorrow but in order to create what we call accessible innovation things that can fit everyone in the world and there are two methods that we built and we work with the organization one of them called just impact and connect sustainability to innovation and the other one with vice versa connect innovation to sustainability but again it's connecting the dots the things that the organization do between innovation and sustainability and see the value of this connection and the other thing is about changing the focus it's not enough to do sustainability or innovation or to talk about the corporate impact or what the corporate is doing and how much uh, paper did you consume or how many employees do you have that's not that and it's not how you help your employees to do the change it's about how you help or allow your clients or your customer to really do the change can you help them because if you can create or if you want to create a real impact and to create really an ROI, you need not to help your organization. No one cares how many papers you have or how many people with disabilities you have in your organization. The main thing is about how you allow your clients, the people you are working with to do that. And I will be happy to elaborate more about possible, but in, in one sentence, it's about creating value to the corporates and showing them how putting accessibility and creating accessibility by design can create value to the corporates, creating products and the upcoming product that will be innovative, of course, but accessible to everyone can create a, a great ROI to them. So the main thing is about do the connection between innovation and sustainability if you want to see the ROI of accessibility. And the other thing is changing the focus from looking at the organization or looking at the employees, you're looking at the clients and how to help them do the change. Amazing, thank, thank you. Thank you, Nir, for that. Um, Bernard, hello. Can you please introduce yourself and just let us know your thoughts on, on how um, disability inclusion um, can be sold to stakeholders, how, what, what, how we can show the value in that? Uh, is Bernard there? If Bernard, not, we can't hear you. We're not even here, but we can't hear him. Whether you want to try again? No, we can't hear you. Um, we'll see, He's maybe we can... We can hear him. Bernard, maybe we'll come back to you, Bernard. We can start the tech, but in the, in the meantime, Lucy, are you okay to, to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Everyone get Bernard up and, and talking. It's always the tech, isn't it? A tech event. Um, so I, I'm Lucy Ruck. I um, work for Business Disability Forum. If you, you haven't heard of us before, we work with businesses um, on a global and UK level to help them get things right around disability, um, covering all sorts of different aspects. Um, oh, is Bernard working now? Sorry, just getting a bit of feedback, I think. Um, yeah, there's definitely some feedback. Um, God. There we go. I'll carry on. Um, okay. <laughs> so as I work for Business Disability Forum, and I uh, coordinate a group called the Technology Task Force. So that's that's the tech element of it, with a uh, number of uh, members and partners who I've sort of seen on the list already today. Um, who we work with, like Microsoft, Google, Barclay, so on and so forth. So lots lots of big corporates we work with. Um, and return on investment, and this is a really interesting one, because when I saw return on investment and do we need to have a return on investment for doing the right thing for people with disability, there's a little part of me that kind of cringed a bit with that, I'll be entirely honest with you. But I think we also have to be realistic that we don't all have great CEOs um, like we had this morning uh, from HSBC and Channel 4 and so on, who were kind of saying, this is important, we just need to do that stuff. Um, so I think there's a little part of me that needs to get over that as well and go, these are questions people are still being asked on a really regular basis. Uh, but I want to talk about something slightly different. So rather than the kind of facts and figures, which are great, but 
sometimes a little bit difficult to connect to and really get that reality check on this stuff. Um, I wanted to talk about stories and the importance of storytelling as part of this. And the one I often think about is a colleague I worked with called Debbie. And, and this will resonate with many of you for different reasons, I'm sure, and even from your own lived experience. But I worked with Debbie and she had a sight loss and she worked in a call centre and they implemented a new CRM system, bearing in mind she was already working there. She already had sight loss. Um, and they didn't take into account her accessibility needs when procuring the new system. I mean, this is not anything new to many of us on the call, I think. Um, and it literally took them nine months for her to be able to do her job. So Debbie couldn't work for nine months. So I kind of always come back to that story of Debbie. And actually, no one wanted to be Debbie. No one wanted to feel like Debbie did and feel like they were left behind and not included as part of that process. And, and it wouldn't have taken that much to have included her and to make her part of that process uh, it's just really important so actually my return on investment is actually Debbie an individual because I think that's really important um, I, I also want to say that actually the CRM system they implemented everyone hated it it didn't really work for anyone it was really clunky so you know there's always this synergy between making sure stuff's accessible and then usable for everyone else as well so I just wanted to stress that point um, but I also want to say we should always treat people as we want to be treated ourselves. And that's all Debbie wanted. And that's all we should want. We should treat people with respect. So if you want a kind of what your return on investment, it's actually treating people as human beings and with the respect that they deserve. Um, and also bearing in mind that, of course, 83 percent of people acquire their disabilities during working life. So we're talking about a large amount of people who aren't born with disabilities, but acquire it. You don't want to lose that talent. And that there's a, a fabulous quote that's sort of been flown around uh, and it's that disability is the only minority group that anyone can join at any time and it knows no barriers but i think in this it's just really powerful because actually this could be any of us joining this group so don't we want to make it work for all of us so it's probably not the statistics and the the facts and figures we want around return on investment but that that's kind of my throw my hat in in the ring on that one yeah, no, that resonates a lot. And it's, that's an interesting point. What's your return on investment? Well, if you're, if you're buying uh, a system, if you're procuring a tool in the workplace, and if not everyone can use that tool, then you've spent money on that tool. So you, it's not it's not fit for a purpose. So there's a, there's a loss in productivity there. So it's not money well spent. So yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, Okay, so who do we have left on our panel? Bernard, how is your audio system working? Um, I'm hoping now you can hear me. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Brilliant. Yes. Lo loud Thank, and you. Thank you, Bernard. Yeah, it'd be lovely if you can just give us a brief introduction to yourself and your thoughts on this on this topic of return on investment. Yeah, thank you, Adi, and uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so my name is Bernard Shira, and I run Innovate Now, which is a startup accelerator uh, of GDI Hub that has been supporting assistive tech entrepreneurs in Kenya since 2019. And to date, we've supported uh, more than 30 entrepreneurs, actually 37 to date. And um, basically for us, I mean, um, the reason we work with entrepreneurs and the reason we work with innovators is because there is this notion that in this space, you cannot run uh, an, an, uh, a profitable entity or a non-profit that is sustainable. And I think that is where I want to come at this. Um, we uh, are in a world today that is driven by uh, the power of business, the power of investments to change uh, the lives of people. Uh, and, you know, the thing about assistive product is for a long time in many markets, they have uh, not been delivered through the forces of uh, demand and supply and that is because nobody invested in creating uh, local uh, businesses that can meet those needs so at innovate now we embarked on a huge moonshot three years ago and this moonshot was to say uh, can local businesses meet the needs of people with disabilities in a sustainable way can you build businesses that actually deliver low-cost assistive products in Africa. And this is what we went out to test. What are the business models that would be required to make this a reality? Um, and I think I'm proud to say that uh, it is possible to invest in ventures that specifically deliver products 
uh, for persons with disability in the market. These ventures can be profitable businesses, as we've seen with some of our startups. And, and, and I think the message here really goes out to uh, both investors and also uh, development uh, aid that is, uh, and, and also philanthropy really, uh, that it's, it's, it's high time we paid more attention uh, to the work that entrepreneurs and ventures are doing to try and address the gap in uh, access to affordable and quality assistive products. And I think, you know, when we start to think of them um, as businesses that can deliver value, uh, then we also start looking at persons with disability differently, not just as, you know, users or beneficiaries, but as customers who need products that work, products that are affordable, products that are accessible. And this is the return on investment you can deliver by supporting uh, ventures that are being supported by organizations like myself, because we teach how to run um, sustainable organizations that will not depend on grants to serve their clients or to grow. And I think this is what we've already validated and are now thinking about how do you go creating, uh, you know, um, stronger mechanisms of directing early stage capital to these businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. That's a, that's a really important point. And it's what Nir had touched on this earlier. It's about innovation. And, and so, you know, the, the need for assistive technology, technology that helps people who are disabled um, and how that requires innovation. And, and also it needs to be sustainable because if a business doesn't want to create that, if it's not profitable, then they won't, they won't, they won't make that technology and the needs of disabled people would not be met. But in the, in the same token, if people do make assistive technology, but it's too expensive, you know, if it's not, it's not then then people will not be able to afford it. So, um, to be to be able to drive down the prices and, and increase the innovation and to make that sustainable for for a business, I think that's that's amazing and and, and um, it's, it's some great work in that space. Um, okay, I don't have my list of panelists. Is there um? Who's, who else is here? I know some panelists were arriving. Eric here late. as well. Is that, sorry? Eric. 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 Oh, Eric, you've arrived. Lovely. Hi, Eric. Uh, Hi. Lovely. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, Eric, yes, can you please just give us a little background to yourself and, and your thoughts on this area? Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yep. All right. Good. Good. Uh, I am a white male. Uh, 95, 99% bald, uh, middle, mid build. Uh, and I am calling from, uh, I'm calling from in from Seattle and I myself have a disability. I'm a T4 incomplete. Um, uh, I, I use a, a scooter, a walker, a cane, and I wear an AFO. Uh, so, uh, that's my disability. And, Open Door I founded 23 years ago because um, I got carried off an airplane in Montgomery, Alabama, and I was like, this isn't right. And I didn't feel like I could go back and cover my territory uh, if, you, if I had to use a wheelchair, a manual chair. So um, I dropped my job and started Open Doors, and our mission is to make goods and services accessible to people with disabilities and travel, tourism, and transportation. And really, one of the things that we did early on, there's a ton of stuff that we do, and we could spend all day talking about it, but I know we're here to talk about ROI. And I think one of the most important things that I did, did as an organization, and this is really what branded us early on, was we did a market study with a very credible firm, Harris Polling, uh, in the U.S. And that branded us in 2002, I think uh, the study did. And now we're like four or five into them. And we've got some amazing trends and things to talk about in the studies. Um, and for this group in particular, I'm going to give you some numbers because I can kind of quantify some of this ROI uh, kind of on a larger scale um, and really on a, a U.S. market basis. And remember that my studies were done with U.S. travelers with disabilities. Um, so uh, it's not purely reflective of the world, but it does show that we travel outside of the world. But I'll give you some top line uh, numbers from our studies. Um, first, uh, 
general travel, we showed that we, we, uh, we're up to $29 billion a year. And that is just what we're spending traveling. And that's only me. All right. Our study also shows that I travel with two and a quarter person. So you can just, you know, but if you look at that, people don't believe that number. So you can't just, I just leave it at the 29 billion. That's us. And I won't tell you that we travel with a family member because then it doesn't look good. It looks skewed, but we are traveling with family members and it's not a skewed. It's a fact. And I think it's the reality of it for sure. Um, we travel by air. We account for about uh, it's well, let me just say that 29 billion is up uh, from like 17 billion. Uh, so that is from 2015 to 2020. And our last study was done kind of before and during COVID. So we got some really interesting numbers. And one of the interesting numbers was, is that we were going to come back and travel more. And you see that actually happening in the leisure traveler in aviation, especially and with the hotels. Um, so in aviation, we account, uh, and we're up 11 billion, 9 billion in 2015. That's in the past two years. And then Ron Pettit, who I consider one of the most, you know, pioneers of accessible travel and having him on the call is great. But one thing that he didn't mention is, is that, well, cause he doesn't want everybody to know, but the cruise industry really understands accessibility and what it needs and takes to have people with disabilities because people are already taking cruises um, and Ron's really put together some experiences that people have short excursions now and there's a lot to do in cruising. Um, our study shows that we actually people with disabilities cruise at a higher rate than the general public. Now Ron knows that and so that's why they have, do all these events and programming because they know it's turning into dollars. Um, and the cruise industry has always known that it's, it's they kind of hide it, but it's the truth. They're building more and more ships like this new ship is going to have an accessible suite. I mean, I hope somebody can afford it out, who's out there that has a disability because it sounds like an amazing experience. But in an accessible room, I think that's fantastic. And that just shows the progress because now we know from now on those new ships are going to have it at, at these levels. Right. I mean, you could go on a cruise ship with Ron now and there's a million accessible rooms to look at. Uh, but back to some of the numbers, because I know we're a technology. This is a group about technology. The, mo the most important thing I think that's come out of our studies every year since 2002, the first study is, is that people with disabilities are booking online at a higher rate than the able body. All right. The general traveler is not book online at the pace that we do. We also call in. That's our number two thing. So we're either booking online or we're calling you. So if your app and your website are not 100 and 10% accessible, it's almost like you threw up the hand because if you're not accessible, then we're not gonna do it because like I said, we're booking online. We're not afraid to do it. The internet is a great tool for people with disabilities. Let's face it, right? Um, you know, it, it allows us 86% say that they actually go on the web to find information about their travel. So everybody's basically getting on the web to look and see what they're doing and see accessibility. So right now in aviation we're having the one click campaign which is like every airport every airline on your home page you should have some kind of uh, way that people are one click away from accessibility information on your home page you don't have to drag and go here and there it's right on your home page you'll have how to get information on accessibility and so i know in aviation that's a big movement i'm sure we could do that other places as well but the most important thing again in technology is is that that's how we're booking. That's how we're looking at things. That's how we're booking our trips. So if you're not accessible, you can guarantee we're not doing it. Um, then the next best thing for us is social media. So once we have a good trip, everybody's posting it. And that keeps going up higher and higher from 2002, because I don't know if in 2002 we had Facebook. But if you don't have the right web presence and you're not tapping in to the social media part of accessibility, um, I know it's tough and it, as a business, you have to be careful uh, because you don't want to tap into it wrong and make yourself look bad either. Uh, but getting your technology together is a huge part of it because people with disabilities are making decisions based on what they're finding online. Here's some more numbers on technology use. So 76% uh, uh, look for their travel needs online and booking accessible hotels, 48% are booking accessible hotels online. People are looking up destinations to visit online. 
Uh, almost everybody does that. <laughs> uh, and nearly all travelers with disabilities, 95% eat out in restaurants at all their trips. So everybody's going out to eat at a restaurant. If you're a vacation zone, I'm telling you right now that 95% of us, if your restaurant's not accessible, you're losing it. That means having your menu be able to be scanned, right? Me being able to look online and say, oh, I can go to that restaurant. Um, when planning a trip, a vacation, adults with disabilities generally uh, look to eat out at restaurants. I just said that one. Over half also expect to visit family and do family events. So a lot of stuff is family oriented. Um, that's not, that doesn't have much to do with technology, but I'll get another one here for technology for you. Um, also, when we're traveling. All right. So how we use the Internet to support our travel. It has gone from 2005, 44 percent to 76%. And then booking accessible hotels started at 25, it's at 48. So half the people are booking their hotels online. Um, looking for information on restaurants, uh, it's come up from 12% to 33. So the web basically has gone from using the web to everybody using the web, right? So having your information online is super important. Billions of dollars, all right, um, I think, if anybody wants some more numbers, I think I'm out of time. I think, well, Eric, I mean, and that's that's great. You know, we've had um, we've had a mixture of response so far. You know, we've um, Chris was talking about you know um, using the media to talk about the impact of disability inclusion. We've we've had um, stories on some research that's been done that supports um, disability inclusion. We've looked at disability inclusion being a catalyst for, for innovation. And here it's quite clear from, from, from what you've shared that um, there's big numbers to support, you know, um, making your service accessible. You're going to um, acquire more customers uh, and, and, and in particular industries, for example, like in the cruise industry, you said, you know, um, someone with a disability might be might um, or a certain disability group might be more inclined to, to go down that route and if something if you, if your interface is not accessible then a person will not use um your service interesting in the uk we, we've had something called the click away pound which um which shows that over 17 billion pounds a year um of of money is 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 is, is taken away from people that are not accessible so that money will be given to if a disabled person tries to access your website and it's not accessible then they'll be taking that money away to a more accessible competitor and we call that the click away pound so there's real money um behind this um i, I do want to on, on on this area of numbers and this is i mean I, we work with a, a lot of clients and they get kind of stuck at this this business case when it comes to accessibility you know i appreciate organizations that are fairly well developed accessibility might be business as usual for them it might not be something they need to make a business case for as such but with some organizations it's it's like they, they feel they need to um you know calculate some number some return on investment um to to, to provide key stakeholders i don't know if anyone on, on the panel has got any thoughts on that and before I go into that, have I, is, if I, have I, have I addressed everyone here on the panel? Is there, is there any more people that can please like me, sir? No, I think you've been to everyone, Addy. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, couldn't have anyone left aside. Um, so, yeah, on that question of how important do you think that is, you know, do, do, we, do we need to have specific numbers and show particular evidence um, before we can continue or begin our... Um, um, disability inclusion work in our organizations. If, if anyone wants to talk to that, that'd be great. Hmm. Yeah, it looks like he's going to jump in, but I'll, I'll quickly say something. I think it depends who you're looking to speak to. Uh, so I agree with Lucy that it, it can be quite irksome, you know, like why do I, why do you, you know, a person is, is valid, is, is a whole <laughs> by themselves. They don't actually have to be you know, the best educated and the best, um, and I'm saying this as a professor at UCL, right? but you don't have to say, you know, everybody is just a, a very valid human being, right? That's the first bit. And, and I think that they have a human right to expect things like assistive technology or access to healthcare or equal access to a building or a piece of software, right? That's just like, that's just, it, it's the basics. However, <laughs> however, 
uh, if you go to countries and, and I go to you know, even in the UK, um, we have difficult decisions to make. Right? We, there isn't enough money to do everything you would want to do to make the country uh, fair and, and equal for, for all people. Um, and that problem is even more difficult. If you look at Pakistan at the moment and the flooding that's happening there, for example, you know, you look at Ukraine at the moment, that's a incredibly difficult spaces. And so what are you going to do first? The war ends in Ukraine. What are you going to do first? Right? And, and how are you going to make things inclusive? But equally, you're going to be able to a country, make sure it's inclusive, right? Like, like you've got a great opportunity to make it the most inclusive uh, space I in the world. So I think that the numbers are needed are not shouldn't be needed, but are needed when you're trying to, even for say universal healthcare at one at one level, then obviously all healthcare should be accessible. And obviously we should all have access to assistive technology like the glasses I'm wearing or the, I know, the therapy I, I might need to, to help with some of my neurodiversity uh, issues. But those, those things I should have access to, right? And they should be provided uh, for me. But when you're talking, I remember being in, uh, in a country where I was speaking to a minister and the person before me Minister of Health, and the person for, before me was trying to sell, it's a low and middle income country, they were trying to sell them proton treatment for cancer to care. That's what they were trying to tell them. Now, the, the country in question is making questions about should they provide more radiotherapy across their whole country? Should they provide proton treatment to demonstrate to the world that they are, you know, rising up the, the lower to middle to upper middle to high income country? And then I'm going in saying, we should invest in assistive technology instead, right? And at that point, you do need some figures. You need something to help them make the argument. You need something to make their life a bit easier in, in advocating for this space. Um, and I think the, the story you give, Lucy, um, uh, is a great example. I think stories are great, but they also sometimes need to be backed up uh, by the figures. And I think, you know, Cush or Bernard, uh, I'm sure you, Eric, I haven't met you before, but you sound like a, a brilliant uh, uh, advocate and campaigner as well. But I think you need this sort of um, two punch approach, if you like. <laughs> you need to and you need to judge the person. So it's not even different ministers will react to different things. You need to be able to to sense the person you're selling to, if, if you like, and see what it's not even what they need, but what they need to unlock the investment into the space that you're speaking to. And obviously, if you're speaking to ministers, that will be very different to sort of on a startup looking for 20 50k ticket size right at the very beginning of my journey i'm speaking a different language again but i will still need some numbers at the angel investment side maybe i don't need the numbers maybe the passion and the, and the stories are enough but to unlock the next ticket i will need the numbers you know so it's i, I think unfortunately we do have this uh, duality that, that is necessary but just just following on from kathy's great point um i saw this study in canada actually um, that states if Canada was a fully accessible and inclusive society, the economic benefit would amount to approximately 340 billion. And that's in a calendar year that they were talking about 2017. I'll put the link in the chat. And this amounts to approximately 17 and a half percent of gross domestic product. You know, you have countries like the UK that are scrambling in relation to growth. And this is actually a really good way that if we have a fully inclusive and accessible society, 17 and a half percent uplift in GDP. Imagine, you know, 20. They don't believe you, Kush. They don't believe. Like you said, I, I don't know about you, but it's so hard. It's like we know it. It's really obvious. And yet somehow they, they sort of don't believe you. And even, you know, you look at some of the tech companies that have spoken today, for example, they're beginning to get it. Does that make sense? But 10 years ago, we were all saying the same thing. I'm sure you were saying the same thing, Kish, and they weren't. The so there is something about thinking about how do we get them to really understand that argument? Um, sorry to interrupt you, Kish. No, it's, it's fine. Uh, it's, it's true. But I, I think we can use the tech companies as a good example. The cradle to grave business model is the most sustainable business model. And the fact the biggest tech companies are now the largest companies in the world also just highlights the point that there's a very strong business case. There's a money, very strong monetary purpose of making everything inclusive and accessible. How important is that? And Lucy, if, I, if, if it's okay if I bring the attention to you, the Business Disability Forum works with a lot of organizations. How big is that stumbling block of, of organizations wanting some hard numbers or, you know, how will this affect our bottom line? Is that still, you know, prevalent. I know some people cringe at that. You know, myself, I personally lived 
um, experience of disability, I, I struggle with that as well because we don't mm. usually ask questions like, you know, what's the return on investment of making our service usable by, you know, women or people of particular race or, you know, we don't kind of ask yeah. these questions, but when, yeah. when it comes to disability, this is a bit of a, oh, what's the business case? Tell me and then I'll do it. What's it like in, in your experience with, with the companies that you work with nowadays? Yeah, it's brilliant, Addy, and I, I completely agree with you. We don't ask for a business case for why we should employ women or people of different ethnicities or anything else, and, and, and it would be ludicrous to ask such questions. Um, yes, people are still asking this, which is literally last year I posted it in the, in the chat, on the um, Slido chat, uh, a business case for accessibility and some different factors we think will hit the mark, and very much going back to what everyone else has said. I was being slightly facetious by saying, yeah, it's all about storytelling. It's not. It's about a combination of these things. It's about picking what works for certain people and especially if if you can interact with someone and you kind of get a sense for what hits the mark with them um, and sometimes it will be the storytelling or a combination of that and the facts and figures uh, what I would say is there's not one magic thing that makes this work for everybody if there was we would bottle it and sell it for a fortune or or give it away for free because we're that kind of community aren't we um, so there's not one thing that just works I would say in the UK and in many countries around the world, there is, of course, a legal requirement to get this stuff right. So I think it's useful to remind people of that. Uh, people shouldn't forget about that. That is actually quite important. Um, I'd also say if you build stuff from the start with inclusivity in mind and making sure you include people, it actually might not cost you any more. And when you're procuring new systems or going out to your supply chain, just thinking to include accessibility might cause you a lot of a heartache in the future if you start thinking about that stuff we all know to retrofit stuff to make it accessible costs a lot of money i couldn't even give you the figures and i'm rubbish at remembering numbers anyway which is why i tend to think in stories but i think that's really useful to remember ask the questions probe them signpost them to stuff that could be useful um, and then that will help because the return on investment actually the investment could be fairly minimal it's just asking some pertinent questions at the right time to get people thinking but I'll give someone else a chance to chip in on that one I'll just Thank step you. in it's Eric from Open Doors yeah. going back to Kathy and Kush uh, the, I mean we'll all be excited leaving this event as we do all the events and you go back and you bring it to the office and it some, somehow it's, it's a brick wall somewhere like all of a sudden the money we're talking about disappears and you know it's tough to keep that momentum, but there's so many people involved now with the momentum. We keep doing studies. There's numbers out there, and, and it, unfortunately, um, definitely in the U.S., it is mostly about the numbers, um, and we have to sell them on the numbers, and we have to figure out how to get the right numbers because it's a difficult group of people to pinpoint because we cross every boundary. Uh, but ultimately, I think our, our way in and like I've been we've been doing this 23 years at Open Doors is through the numbers. That's how we've always gotten through the door of corporate America, because I can tell you how many people are buying your product. That's yep, that's amazing. And and, and I guess um, what we get what we get from this is, um, you know, different, different approaches for, for different organizations and different stakeholders and, and understanding what is important um to them and trying to bring this in in line and, and i think as, uh, as lucy said it might not even be a massive investment you know but just for people to know um what what is um you know what is needing to be done that that that's interesting was someone about to say something sorry I think yeah I, I i wanted to add to two more points to the discussion because as lucy, as lucy mentioned that the storytelling is important and as eric told us the technology is rising if i remember correctly from 44 percent to 76 percent and it's we're going to see the technology take another part of our life and if i'll connect it to what uh, um Katie has said about the the ability or our ability to, because if we need to think what should be the ideal process then everything should be accessible but it's not happening Eric told us that he is dealing with it for more than 20 years. I'm dealing with it for more than 15 years. It's not the ideal of what we think should happen. If you want to talk about ROI, we need to understand that ROI based on an impact. What kind of impact do you do? And, and if you need, the main thing that you need to do is to prioritize because investors have a lot of options in what to invest. And they need to see 
uh, Eric has mentioned the numbers and Lucy mentioned the storytelling, but I think that the main thing is about creating an impact, showing what kind of impact this startup or can, can create to this investor and vice versa. And that's one of the things that we are doing with the Hackotism, which is a, um, a group of startup and ecosystem that focus on autism and innovation. And we are trying to do it both ways. One way is doing it with the startups and helping them to show their value. It is not about telling outside a good story. And Debbie's story is a wonderful story. And I can still remember the name Debbie. But the main thing is about creating an impact. What kind of impact your startup? Because otherwise, you just have a nice story. And on the other hand, to helping investors understand that investing in what we call today autism tech or accessibility tech can lead us to a variety of more income and much more profitable uh, um, startup and ecosystem. So the first thing was about doing the connection between a base and sustainability and then changing the focus for your client. But I would like to add it to that First of all, the, the building the value of your clients and focusing on the impact. And another thing, and that is about failure. I think that one of the most important thing, and I think Bernard mentioned it when he asked, uh, can you build can you build that business? He said that, uh, that the main thing that he's working with his startup is about understanding, is it even possible? And I think that the most important thing is about being able to fail very fast and very cheap and show some kind of a, proof of concept. And that's mainly what we do even with startups or with ecosystem manager to show them how very fast they can see the value of it. Does it even work? What kind of value will it create? If you it fail, you want to see it very fast. And I think that as long as we see these four pillars doing the connection between innovation and sustainability, changing the focus to your client, creating value, not stories, and changing the time zone. Try thinking about what you can do tomorrow and how you can affect the technologies that are about to go outside in the next 10 years instead of trying to fix in them retroactively again and again and again and making things that are out there being inaccessible and solving some broken things that other people put outside. So I think the most important thing is doing the connections between all these pillars and being the willingness to create an impact or to show it even to investors, but the willingness to fail, fail very fast and very quick, but to show what it can, what value it can create. Thank you, Nia. That's um, very important. Mm -hmm. Impact. I think we all agree. If people see the the positive impact um, your decisions can make, then that's a quite a strong motivator. Bernard, um, when you worked with um, a lot of the the, the organisations. How did you convince them that assistive technology was, you know, was um, something that they should go down and it was feasible? Did you focus on impact? Is, is that what you did? Bernard, um, I can't hear you. I don't know if anyone else can. No, we haven't got audio. Try again, Bernard. No. Not again. He's trying something. Oh, bless. Doing audio description for you, Addy. He's trying something. Oh, okay, my. Yes. Audio okay. Yeah. Right. There we go. Yeah. About that. yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I was just saying that this job of convincing never ends. So um, we are still doing it. Um, but just to just to respond to the spirit of the question, I think the idea here is we have to continuously learn how to how to communicate or how to talk the language of investment, of measuring impact. Because unfortunately, the, uh, the, the people who have the um, power to make a difference, whether it's governments, uh, whether it's investors, they will always need to uh, justify this to someone else or to other uh, you know, uh, parties. So I think this idea of numbers and Really, the language also, I think it's a, you know, for a long time, I think our sector has been talking in, in two languages. One is the medical language, and two is the right language, which is brilliant, which is needed. But I think we um, are now beginning to learn how to communicate with, uh, with the business leaders, how to communicate with the investors on matters disability. And I think even to kind of go back and show uh, wait a minute, guys, let's look at technologies that have changed the world today and trace that to having been developed for persons with disabilities. And I'll give you an example, actually, because yesterday I was reading this, and it's about the touchscreen technology 
uh, and, and that's an amazing technology, but most people don't know that the company that developed this called Fingerworks uh, was actually uh, developed out of the need of um, the founder, one of the founders had a problem with, uh, I think he was a pianist and he had a problem with his joints playing the piano and he figured there must be a, a simpler way of operating a phone and he, uh, him and his co-founder, they developed this technology uh, and they had these patents for that screen and Apple bought this company and use that as a basis to develop the first uh, touchscreen iPhone that everybody today in the world uses. But guess what? Because of addressing a need uh, that was, you know, maybe at that point, if you ask somebody, hey, what's the return on investment of investing in this touch thing? Who's gonna, and it probably at that time would have been, nobody's gonna buy this, but look at it today. Yeah. It is a technology serving everybody and I think this is the, the thing about uh, innovating for uh, persons with disabilities, whether it's accessibility, whether it's assistive technology, we always have to find this way of communicating. Look, uh, this is going to advance humanity. It's not just for persons with disabilities. Yes, now it may very much look like so, but we, we push boundaries. We find easier ways uh, of, uh, of functioning. And I think this ends up uh, um, helping all of humanity. And I think if we continue learning how to articulate this in business language, in uh, governance language, I think we are going to unlock more investment for this space. Fantastic, Bernard. Um, that is, I know today was interesting listening to Sarah Her Herlinger this morning um, talking about the, the innovations Apple are doing. She mentioned um, where you can control the Apple Watch just by squeezing, you know, your, your fists or just control it by, by the muscles. And obviously that is something that would be necessary for someone with limited mobility. Um, and if you were to think, oh, what's the financial benefit in that? You might not think much, but um, she then explained that actually um, after creating something like that they realize that it, there's much there's a bigger use case for it you know uh, people in places where they can't use their hands uh, would benefit from from such um, such features so that just shows that when you look at disability inclusion it it forces you to innovate to, to make something possible for that person with disabilities but then it enhances the world it makes it a better place so we get things like touch screen we get things like our home speakers, you know, text to speech, all this kind of technology that otherwise the mainstream wouldn't have even created for themselves because there wasn't a need and the need came from helping someone with a disability overcome an access need they have. Um, how are we doing, uh, Louise? I don't know if you've got any questions that have come in, um, just to check. Yeah. Or are we looking at the questions? Um, yeah, there's a few questions that's came through. Um, so the first one that I can see is, does the business sector need to push education sector more to focus on the focus of the benefits of developing accessibility skills and focus for all graduates? We'll go with yes, shall we? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good one up there, yes. I do think it's interesting. When we started GDI Hub, we did a quick audit. This is not like a published piece of work. We did a quick audit of, of the amount of uh, education the average architect gets in the UK in five years for an accessibility. It's one hour. And then that's five years ago. So it might have changed. We haven't benchmarked it since then. But it was literally it's one hour. Right. If you look at the you know, we try to infiltrate the, the computer science degree here at UCL and, you know, like, <laughs> like talk to, to everyone, you know, get get them on board early. But it's it, it should be core you know if you if you can get it through so Hector Minto was in the chat a minute ago talking about you know the the government why aren't we pushing for for things like procurement to be accessible and it reminded me of of the procurement for the, the Olympics and Paralympics right so the built into the procurement system of, of Vicky Austin was here my co-director charged the Paralympic legacy program she would be telling you that the 
that the procurement system was set up for accessibility. It wasn't enough that your your, your cars that you if you were going to drive the athletes around that the cars were vehicles were accessible, say for wheelchair users or had induction loops in. You had to employ fifteen percent of your I think it was fifteen percent to check, but a percentage of uh, disabled people in your workforce, right? So. It, construction companies had to have a, a percentage of disabled people in their workforce so, so all of a sudden you had a representation within the workforce across the entire delivery of the olympics and the paralympics and also you couldn't split the olympics and paralympics you had to buy the advertising rights to both it, it was of equal value and so so i think when you build that into procurement but why aren't we building it into accreditation so why can't there, there can be no account you know no nobody should be able to graduate even say that, no, that as an accountant without understanding the impact of disability inclusion as a doctor without having done some some you know some inclusion uh, criteria like if you if you infiltrated that uh, accreditation stage and made sure that everybody was you know understood how their sector or, or, or their profession could make the world a fairer place through disability inclusion then we would have fewer problems because once people are genuinely exposed to the issues and see that actually a lot of the times with an inclusive mindset you do get into that deep user centre design and it is better you come out with better solutions generally and once people go through that process they're convinced you don't I've never seen anyone take like an inclusive design problem and go oh no this is rubbish I'm not doing this there's no point in this like I'm never doing this but what are you doing everybody goes oh my god I didn't realize this was a problem this is this I really want to do more in this space so if you built it in I think you could you could have a real I think it's a great question whoever asked it thank you I, I was just going to add to it quickly if I might do and it's a bit of a plug for another session later on in the week on Thursday okay. afternoon there's an uh, there's a session about um uh, accessibility teams and I know we've got Mark Wilcox from Atos coming on to that mm. one talking about the um, accessibility internships that I know him and his colleague Neil Millican from Atos have worked very close to and he's going to be plugging that because we realise there's a massive skills gap they don't cover it at a university level anywhere really or it's, a, it's an additional module that people decide not to do so this is really important it's a great question and we'll come to that on Thursday in another panel that I'm on so yeah good thank you I, I will just add one sentence that I think that we should encourage them or convince them not about the need we all agree that accessibility is very important we don't need to convince anyone about that, about that but to convince them about the profitability show them the value to show them that it creates an impact to show them that if you do accessibility tech then it can be broader and can be accessible to everything we know now as speech to text and the other and the other amazing and then i think the, the the importance of industry talking to education to say by the way accessibility inclusive design this is important to us so you know please can you have this part of the the education curriculum that's that's important uh i'm really sorry we only squeezed one question in um sorry my bad but we had a lot a lot of a lot of um talk uh, on this subject so i don't know the questions that haven't been answered i'm not sure what the process is to answer them i i um so I'm apologised to the people that have asked them. Um, as we have uh, finished, uh, run out of time, uh, all that is left to say is I'm really, really grateful uh, to the amazing panel that we've had uh, on today. I hope that gave you some insight into um, disability inclusion and the various uh, nuances when, when it comes to return on investment uh, in this area and how to motivate people investing in this area thank you so much uh, guys for joining me uh, on this session thanks all lovely to see you thanks, thanks everyone thanks for joining thank you. Me. take care bye bye bye, bye. bye.